Hello, everybody from London. It's sunny, very cold. And uh, I just said to my wife, I'm just going to Naples. Um, so I feel like I, I should be in Naples with all of you. Um, and continue, I'm very happy to continue in some kind of strange remote way, uh, a rich and enjoyable both friendship and collaboration with, with Ferruccio, the University of Naples, the fellow assistants and, and students. The title of my lecture is Somewhere Between Tradition and Modernity. It fits within the uh, transitional landscape theme of the conference in a certain type of way. The focus on this transitional landscape as described is on the kind of marginal and as described the malleable the malleable parts of the city in both historic center and periphery and when i think of what that might mean that issue of transition i think of the transition between spaces i think of the transition between change between one condition and another and I think about the relationship between design and between context, where the notion of mediation becomes an instrument of change. Um, it's both a, an act of transition and an act of change of something new. Um, and this lecture is a sort of prompt for architects, young architects perhaps, to try and find their, to pitch their work within the context of the, in the end, the traditional city towards an identity of a contemporary architecture. But it's ultimately seeking and recognizing that we have a responsibility to the city. And we have a responsibility to be useful in an unknown future. Thomas Struth, of which these next few images um, is the author of, was, this, was a German photographer who studied painting under Gerhard Richter um, and then joined the photography course in Dusseldorf that was led at the time by Berndt and um, Hiller Becker. He made a series of pictures of city streets that demonstrate an interest in an, a sort of neutrality. They have signs of occupation in the past, the bullet holes in the walls, the signs of appropriation and occupation. And they strike me as very powerful observations of the potential of the city and the condition, the characteristics of the European city in particular, and the role that buildings play within the city, that their responsibility is to the public space, almost in an independent way to their responsibility to support the interior. And I've always been very interested in this dual role of the face of the building. When we look at the city, we need to think of it as a place of cultural coexistence where different aspirations and inspirations come together. It's a place of vitality, it's a place of communication. And the background fabric, which is almost always housing, is a place that supports the potential for community it offers integration, it forms neighborhoods. It also provides the potential for anonymity. But I think in acting upon it, we need to become more sensitive to the way that buildings can contribute to the quality of shared space and how they can enhance a sense of civility and often a gentle civility that can be adapted to embrace both the everyday and the, the special occasion. And I think we must engage 
fully with the ambiguous spaces, the thresholds between private rooms and the public space, space that we might call the space between. Naples is such an extraordinary city and one that I have visited a few times and indeed studied uh, or, or placed projects with uh, my students from TU Munich. The powerful urban structure of the Cardo and Decumanus um, laid over a powerful topography creates a rich structure that creates a, a, a backdrop for quite an extraordinary urban life, an urban setting. A setting that is so multi-layered in terms of um, dimensions of public and private space that one can find oneself completely alone at one moment and yet at the same, within a minute uh, surrounded by a throng of people. That there are buildings that declare their cultural significance, their economic significance become sentinels within the city. And very interestingly, and often almost at the same scale as the civic architecture, domestic architecture also has a very powerful presence within the urban landscape. And as we know, <laughs> you know much better than I do, behind this structure lie a rich network of transitional and connecting spaces, some of which become particularly special. Um, for example, of course, the work of uh, Ferdinando San Felice that is designed to ennoble the act of leaving the street and arriving at the front door of one's home. It is a celebration of that deep threshold, a, uh, a, a raising up of the status of the idea of living inside the block. And it was that exact sort of issue that our students studied um, some years ago, placed projects within this dense fabric, trying to understand what type of architecture, what is the grammar of the architecture that occupies these inner spaces. Those inner spaces that we understand as voids, but in fact in, uh, in, a, in an attempt to try and solidify those voids, studies were made to uh, turn them inside out into solids. So these models um, were made of projects both in Naples and in different European cities of the spaces, the rich spaces between and within building fabric. Such an example, the Casa del Pati in Barcelona, in which what you see is air, uh, the inner courtyard space becomes the solid and the occupied space becomes the void. This is the project by um, MBM, by um, Boigas, <clears throat> Matarel and Mackay, Mackay. So the city is full of narrative. It's, a, it's clear that the character of a city is defined by never ending change. It's significantly affected by the numerous daily consequences of life, of cultural memory, of personal experience, all of which lie within the reality of things and things remembered. 
But how do we find a language, an identity for the architecture of the city, and one that is thick with the residue of time? When I think towards the architecture of the 50s and 60s, say, in other European cities other than Naples, and in maybe in particular in um, Madrid, in, um, excuse me, I was, was going to say Barcelona, but I actually meant in Milan. I see a kind of fascination that the outside world saw channeled later through pages of the architectural magazines of Domus and Casabella in this interest in continuity, continuita. It was at the heart, at the center of the debate on finding an appropriate contemporary language for urban architecture of old European cities. And Gio Ponti, as did Oriol Boigas in Barcelona, rejected the Kayam type grand proposals of large scale redevelopment in favor of incremental projects that transformed the scale and the capacity of the city while at the same time retained the sense of its history. This was the idea of maintaining continuity without contriving completeness. It was an avoidance of presenting old and new in contrast to one another. It was seeking to make connections to the city while at the same time working towards a certain autonomy of formal composition. It was almost of a non-historic continuity and, the, and of a non-modernist rupture. The Casa del Pati in Barcelona that you see in this image, built between 61 and 64 by Matarol, Boigas and Mackay, was a building of the city as much as for the city. It has an enigmatic and, a, and austere facade, an assembly of parts with twisted vertical brick extrusions resting on hammerhead posts and beams, almost like brick battlements. But inside, the space between is presented as a quasi urban space, complete with textures of the streets. Where, but where top light and distance from the street create an otherworldly atmosphere. It's strangeness, the presence of elements we think as belonging to public space of the city, but placed here beyond the domain of the public, somehow is emphasized in their seclusion. It has almost a nostalgic power of the vernacular. It holds to me clues of this seeking for an, of an architecture of the city and for the city. Here you can see in plan, in many ways, it's quite rationally organized with apartments which are almost the same placed around the periphery. And the consequence of that are, is a, a, a set of two interconnecting interior courtyards linked by walkways. And the stacking of the apartments gives this stepped form that conforms only sort of marginally to the, uh, to the grid of the city. And in the basement, in the lower ground floor, this kind of nostalgic fountain but one that as you enter the building and the sound of the streets, the sound of the streets disappear, and the, but the sound of water uh, becomes perceptible. It's a very special situation, full of memory and reminiscence of moving about through the old city, and yet uh, as a result, a sort of communal somehow creates a kind of communal intensity and proximity uh, and yet it's embodied 
within a, a new building. This search for an architecture of the city has been something that is, I guess, at the very heart of our own practice over 25 years. And just racing through three or so projects very quickly, I just wanted to, in a way, describe a number of different typologies. Let's say starting with the idea of corner. This is the project that Ferruccio uh, referred to in his lovely introduction. Um, thank you, Ferruccio of the uh, social housing project and crash in Geneva on the Rue de Sondrier, a site that was extremely challenging because on one side, as you, as you can see from the right-hand side, there was a 240 meter long platform and tower building from Marc Sauget from the mid sixties. And on the other side of the corner, a Beaux-Arts, neoclassical school, both very fine buildings, and the new corner block had to mediate between those two architectures, the architecture of the, 19th, the 18th and 19th century of the city on one side, which was about street continuity, and the architecture of the object of the 60s. And the, the resolution from our point of view was to establish a powerful connective base onto which five floor, a five floor structure rested, um, which demonstrate had two uh, proportional structures, but that was flush on the street side to the uh, Beaux-Arts school, but began to facet to emphasize itself as an object and therefore pick up the rhyming of the towers that you can see in the image uh, here. So the project found its language through mediation, through uh, a, a set of observations of the context that it, set, that it rested. And we adopted a frame facade that could be inhabited both behind it, but also within it. So outside spaces were set between the thermal line that was pulled back in this case, the, one of the areas of the crash. And that frame was prefabricated and in such a way that it became a stacking of elements. It was both, you know, enjoying the, the contemporary uh, efficiency of precast and prefabricated construction, but put together um, in a way that uh, was, has, has nuance and in fact in, had different patterners. So these colors refer to different mixes of the concrete that we're attempting to mediate with the green stone of the city. And an observation about Geneva is that like Naples, it's so multi-layered that behind the 19th century and the, the, modern, the modern structure lies a medieval network of routes and courtyards, rich to those who know. You can move through the city a little bit like London, in fact, through these back streets and courtyards uh, if you know them. And we understood that our project, which you can see the entrance to the housing is on this side, was part of a network of routes, of passages, um, of galleries, galleries that uh, were well known to be the the within the tradition of access to housing, we found an, a, a similar interpretation from a gateway through a semi-outside space up within, within the block to the rooftops to provide access to the apartments. Apartments that enjoyed this uh, frame structure of multiple window. The second project, which might may be described as remaking the block, is a project that's soon to be completed in Antwerp. Um, this is the island, the old city is in the bottom of the drawing, and the competition that we won together with two other architects was to complete this, 
this will make a new block as part of a regeneration of the eastern part of the main dock. Um, a set of buildings were established where our responsibility was this 80 meter long um, block building and that, that faced the, uh, the dock. There was a palazzo that faced the main street and three smaller buildings that created a different scale in response to the, uh, the, the smaller scale of the, the neighborhood next door. And the interest was how to find an architecture, an appropriate architecture on the water side, somewhere between, you could say, the typology of a warehouse and the typology of a mansion block residential building. Our interest was how the facade could create a seemingly repetitive undulating ribbon facade of uh, uh, that captured outside space as well as uh, formed interior space. And there were links through the block. Um, as you can see here, the, um, to create a porosity that was a sort of secondary, understood as a secondary way through the city. This was the this is the link in our building between the waterside and the inner courtyard. These ribbon-like bays rest on large uh, precast arches, which are formed in one piece that. Um, form a kind of canopy to the uh, commercial use on the ground floor. They have a very direct relationship with the big scale brick. This, this brick is much bigger than the usual brick. You can see that the colouring of the mortar and the concrete are understood to create a kind of um, whole, a complete, a complete entity as opposed to a composition of different parts. And the passageway, the brickwork changes to form the as the same as the the brick at the back of the building, but the um, geometries are are picked up by this twisting of the brickwork that creates a kind of um, movement and rich pattern that's close to your touch. Here, yeah, the building as it stands at the moment. The third project in in. Uh, in Brussels is part of a large project in the Tour and Taxis um, industrial site that we are making together with NOAA Architects and Ave Gay, where there are 17 buildings, uh, a series of solitaire uh, apartment buildings and a care home, in fact, a long Dreyf building, which is like a, a set of mansion blocks and a series of courtyards with buildings supporting that that link the main street to a green park. This becomes a kind of green space. And I just wanted to show one project that we're, is, is now close to completion, uh, a little bit further closer, close to finish than these images actually. But uh, as I, I would describe this as a sentinel, here you can see the site. This is the area of Molenbeek, um, the existing park that's being remade and this wide, space between one of the in, uh, repurposed industrial buildings of the tour and taxi site and then this was our um, master plan project the dark buildings are the ones that our own office are making Here you can see a model view of that and you see the topography dropping down across this wide green avenue So the Sentinel building understands itself as uh, part of a, a kind of family of strong brick, um, tall brick buildings that you see in the city of Brussels. As you know, Brussels really is a city of houses of different scales, but it really is a set of, you know, you know streets are uh, complex entities of many different parts that are pushed together. But the uh, strong tradition of brick and of ornamental brick uh, is, is prevalent. And the concept of, this, of the master plan is very much to engage with that uh, unique characteristic that we see 
in the city. This is the the Sentinel when uh, before it was the brickwork was commencing. You can see that its form was intended to both stand as somehow an autonomous form as well as become the beginning of this um, three uh, five sorry four hundred and fifty meter long for, uh, street facade. You can see the architecture of the uh, the brickwork emerging. And finally, the third project I want to describe was a, a, another current project in Munich, which is working inside the block. Um, this is the type of inner block that is very typical of the 19th century part of Munich. And we won a competition to uh, infill a block situation big challenge you know what's the architecture of of inside the block what is how do you define that it's not a street address within the 19th century context uh it's not really meeting the tradition and uh the tradition is that the inside of the block is usually an industrial building or a set of homemade diy buildings and how do we create a new language. And at the time of the competition, we felt that we had established something that had some potential. Um, what was very important to us was that the uh, it was an un understood to be a kind of unfurling of a complex structure of rooms, that there was a sense that it was a single entity from the street facade to the back of the courtyard, such that this would give status to the inner block. And we won the competition on that basis. This idea that the apartments themselves are like small worlds um, of a set of a constellation of rooms that are interconnected with no really real circulation space. But that one apartment fits together into a, a, com a complete um, honeycomb structure of spaces. Um, and having won the competition and gone to the city, the city rejected the project on the grounds of the boundaries and borders that needed to conform exactly to this condition. So no cutouts, no inner courtyards. So we were left with a very different type of situation. Um, uh, in a way even more complex, even though it doesn't look like it. But this was the, a model study of the project that the this was the scheme, the client then bought this building. So we were able to connect these courtyard spaces, one, two, three, and two, had two street facades. The concept changed from recognizing that this building and this building were really about the edge of the block and this linking bridge building was really of another entity altogether. So these sections really were evolved out of the legal and you know legal codes for light and um, um, distance away from buildings and what developed instead a very different type of answer you could say via these uh, tunnel routes sorry uh, arcade routes three courtyards one type of architecture to the street a second to the back of the building and instead of this labyrinth of interconnected sort of uh, multi-sided rooms that we developed in competition, uh, a more straightforward, but in a way equally complex arrangement of spaces began to develop where diagonal connections were achieved through a, a sort of landscape of interior rooms. Sometimes quite extraordinary shape, shape space plans because of the constraints of the site and the slopings of the roofs that's developed into quite a unique plan of uh, somehow single aspect apartments that have a lot of light coming from above behind them. You can see the evolution as the building rises, the plan becomes quite extraordinary. Um, as the roof gets narrower and narrower, the apartments become exceptional and specific. And the facade, what is the architecture of the inner block? You know, it doesn't need to have the representative value of a of the 19th century street 
but it shouldn't feel like a DIY building or indeed even a warehouse. So what's it, what is evolving is a kind of uh, neutral facade in which uh, it has an organic layer um, of light mesh, lightweight twisted mesh that encourages grow, uh, organic green you know, veg vegetation, becomes a sort of veil within this close proximity of, the, of one apartment to the other or outside space to inner space. <clears throat> I wanted to kind of finish with three key thoughts. One is about COVID world. I mean, recent events have changed our perception of what things are worth. Confinement and social distancing intended to safeguard public health have the effect of overturning many principles we thought were intrinsic to society. The primacy of work, the growth of the economy, being busy, communing with others. Now we cannot be social. Now we have to develop relationships with people and places and objects in a new remote way. Social distancing upends our way of life through the prohibition of social gathering. And so we need to relearn a form of social interaction. And what will be lost potentially, or feels lost at the moment, are the spontaneous constellations created by large numbers of people coming together and the social relationships that happen. And yet here we are remotely, you know, all together. I, I have no idea how many people I'm talking to right now. I'm just talking into the darkness. I'm hoping that someone can hear me. <laughs> we might find new freedoms, however, in these apparent limitations. We're spending more time at home, and this has brought a greater consciousness to these small worlds, no longer a space of transitory rest between other external activities, but now the focal point of our daily life. And this prompts questions about how we should reevaluate the home. Perhaps it should become a more complex, rich labyrinth organized to offer different routes through and about where the outside space becomes an integral part of the landscape of spaces. A bit like, perhaps like this little house, the studio house that we made some years ago, tiny house, 4.2 meters wide by 20 meters long, which has two staircases, a set of spaces that are linked and completely appropriatable. There's no kind of status, particularly between one space and another. There are spaces that the occupier um, gives significance to. It's a labyrinth with a double staircase. You enter rooms from different ends. The outside space becomes another room. It is a sort of world within itself. The second thought is about collective living. I think it's clear that there's been this dramatic shift from the 70s from the public sector towards private ownership. And housing as a provision has been somehow replaced by the notion of the house as a commodity, something that can be traded. And I think that's blunted the potential for housing ideas to develop. What we know from Eurostat and other statistics is that the average size of households in the EU has been shrinking in recent decades. And between 2005 and 13, the number of one and two person homes has risen absolutely dramatically. More people therefore live alone than in a family, and yet houses are overwhelmingly planned to accommodate family groups. And I think this, this uh, highlights a mismatch between con contemporary housing development and typologies and the needs of the citizens that they're intended to accommodate. I'd like to advocate a more in-depth exploration of collective living, a concept that has been developed in recent years by innovative housing associations and reflects a growing demand from individuals and family groups for an affordable shared living environment, which balances the need for privacy and community 
within non-familial households. It means and demands a rethinking in the same way that COVID does of how we live and what architecture can do to facilitate that. This project made by a student in Munich some time ago is an idea of how one could create a kind of uh, a, a building of uh, almost as a piece of infrastructure that through a combination of outside and inside spaces with uh, uh, multiple entrances indeed and, in, and inner connections between rooms creates a kind of constellation of great potential for uh, collective living in different um, communal groups. And the final point is, and what I leave you with is this idea of a house of rooms. I think we may begin to imagine a certain kind of building in the city that can provide a framework for a new collective household. It's a new kind of building that's integrated into the European city that we know is characterized by the block and the street, the yard and the square. But this is a large structure of generous rooms and linked passages. Collective sanitary and mechanical facilities allow space and cost savings and can be balanced by the provision of generous interiors for personal and shared use. It's a communal building, which would be a big urban house of many rooms built to last and to stand in the street with robust proportions, fine materiality. From the outside, its internal uses are not explicit, but generosity and proportion and material presence would enhance the surroundings and give something back to the city. This isn't an, a new idea. What you're looking at is a plan designed by Simon Stevin in 1649, the idea of a collective dwelling where rooms and secondary rooms facilitate a kind of sovereignty of space within the whole. And there are other sort of conceptual projects that many of you know or are aware of there are, that are exploring this idea of uh, a non-hierarchical structural plan where flexibility is promoted, not through moving things, but just through uh, the appropriation of the space and the kind of signifier that is given by the inhabitant as opposed to um, the architecture. And, you know, there are many interesting projects in which this um, idea of the house with equal sized rooms explore. You know, it, it, perhaps its origins come from ideas of the palazzo or the farmhouse. Um, floor plans are structured into rooms of similar size without any well defined hierarchy. So the plan is, is itself is not flexible, but the ambiguity inherent in it makes the house adaptable. What I find challenging in a good way is this house of equal sized rooms does not have a living room with smaller rooms radiating from it. It doesn't really have a dominating center. It becomes a honeycomb structure of room upon room, of almost rooms interlocking within one another. It's a spatial hierarchy that is, it is established also by some kind of volumetric difference through even decoration. But I've got to say that I find it limiting and without any hierarchy, I find it too conceptual. And I therefore feel that the network of rooms, which I can see more clearly in this uh, plan of 1873, of the city house in Berenstrasse, a much more um, useful and adaptable plan of connecting space. I feel that we have to remember that our work is always about an emotive, has an emotive correspondence and an atmospheric implication.
this guy understood already an idea of hierarchy and sovereignty and volumetric apportioning. I'm sure you know who he is. Bob Van Riet reminded us when he referred to the intelligent ruin of the importance of designing buildings for an unknown future. Buildings should be useful, they should be suitable, and they should be usable and reusable with a strong physical identity. They should be an expression of an economy of means and an economy of energy. They should support ideas of social sustainability. They should act as carriers of culture and guardians of cultural continuity and collective space. And it's this grab collecting of the transitional space of the public city that these buildings also need to take responsibility for. And I leave you with this last image of Rome by Thomas Struth that I think embodies so many of those ideas and ambitions for an architecture between tradition and newness. Thank you.